I'm Chris Baker. Um, so I work in Daiquiri's product management group. Uh, I work on product integration specifically, so looking at uh, how do we reuse existing content from industry uh, to enable use cases. So with that, uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some case studies that we did with Siemens. And uh, the first thing I want to do is uh, you know, thank the groups who work within Siemens for allowing us to share this data. Uh, it's not just useful for Daiquiri, but it's really useful for the whole industry to see this kind of data, uh, and also to our team who collected this and did the study, uh, especially Dr. Uh, Stephanie Hutka. So uh, first, let me let me introduce Daiquiri quickly. Um, so uh, you may have seen us before on the back of your badges. Um, we're uh, headquarters in Los Angeles, and uh, we're a provider of core AR technologies, um, like computer vision algorithms and displays. And uh, we use those to create products. So we have uh, two industrial augmented reality wearables, uh, Daiquiri Smart Helmet and Daiquiri Smart Glasses. Um, and we also have a uh, automotive heads-up display. So we're all here because we see the, the potential for uh, you know, augmented reality, virtual reality, related technologies. Um, but really, that, that potential, it's more than, more than a flashy demo or something cool to look at. But it's really about redefining what we're capable of uh, in, our, in our work, in our daily lives, really everywhere. Um, and that's our mission at Daiquiri, and that's why I'm, I'm really excited to give this talk today, because we're going to talk about some, some real you know, uh, rubber meets the road applications. Uh, so in the next few minutes, I'm going to cover uh, two case studies that we, uh, we did with Siemens, um, and uh, also then wrap up by talking about some best practices that we've taken away from our work and, uh, and you know, how you can use those to make your own applications successful. So first, uh, we worked with uh, Siemens Power Services um, on a training application for uh, gas turbine servicing. Uh, so this is a gas turbine, uh, what, it, what it looks like installed in a, a power plant. And it's, it's big. Um, it's a, a complicated piece of equipment, as you can tell just from looking at it. Um, and it's installed with millimeter precision. Uh, it, it's a big investment. And what that means for, uh, for customers is that you know, they really want to get the value out of it. And to get that value, it takes regular servicing. Um, it's not easy to learn how to service one of these things. It's a, it's a complicated process. It takes over three years to be certified to, to do this by yourself. Um, and really, that means a, a big investment. And that's in addition to the fact that most of these people are educated as mechanical engineers to start with. So we asked a question, can AR make this training process uh, better? So this is, uh, this is what a gas turbine looks like. We, we picked one key, uh, key servicing task uh, being assembling a burner. You see a ring of burners there. This is where fuel is injected and burned to spin the shaft of the turbine uh, and ultimately a generator, uh, which puts out electricity from the plant. Uh, and so the application we built to address that had a, a few key components, which I'll cover here. Um, we had a 3D model, um, which showed uh, animations, um, you know, how the parts fit together, how they were uh, to be assembled um, for each step. We had a, a viewer with uh, text instructions for backup, uh, you know, as a reference from the, uh, from the normal assembly instruction. And uh, finally, we had a, a guide across the top, which uh, was where the control and sort of status was for an, the worker. Um, and we have, uh, we have these applications in our booth, so I won't go too much into depth. Uh, drop by and check them out. We can demo this one on request, and we have uh, another one as well. So getting to the data, uh, so we trialed this with uh, three kinds of users. Um, so the first being uh, some novices, so people who had never, uh, never done this kind of work before. They hadn't uh, serviced a, a, a burner or assembled one. Um, we had a refresher. This was actually someone who authored the uh, work instruction, uh, but this was uh, several years prior, and he had not done any servicing for a long time. Um, and finally, an expert. So this is a trainer. Uh, and so we noticed in the assembly time um, that all of these times are, are about in the same ballpark. As expected, the expert was, of course, the fastest. Um, but it's, it's a great takeaway that we saw that uh, you know, AR was able to allow somebody on their first try to, uh, to be able to be pretty quick. And taking another look at that data, um, so for comparison, normally uh, you'd first go through a bunch of classroom training, right, before you did your first assembly. Um, you would have to, you know, review the instruction. You would talk to your instructor. He would walk you through the process, make sure you're familiar. Um, with AR, we're much less time than that. Um, and this is not to say that you're not doing training and, you know, 10% of the time that you are doing, but it gives the opportunity, right, uh, for you to repeat this multiple times um, to improve the quality or, uh, you know, to take different approaches, right, where you can have both some time benefit and also quality benefit. Um, 
So we didn't just look at the, the performance, but we also looked at user adoption. So we used a system usability scale uh, interviewing each of our participants. Um, and this is a, an industry standard. It's been used uh, for uh, thousands of, of studies with new technology coming into industry. And looking at this, uh, there's two important thresholds. So one is 68, which is considered an average score that we have marked. Uh, so if you're above this threshold, the technology is considered uh, you know, more usable and learnable than average. Um, and if you're above the threshold of 80, there's uh, research that shows um, this is where your users will you know, passionately adopt this technology. Um, they're going to talk to their friends about it. They're going to ask for it for their own work. Uh, so this is really great that we got uh, you know, responses from uh, our refresher and our novice who would, would be the main users uh, above the 80 threshold and also our expert was uh, well above the 68 threshold. So key takeaways from this, um, we were able to improve the speed and efficiency for, for the training, uh, which is really great. Not only uh, can you apply the knowledge immediately and uh, you know, do this right away without uh, the, the classroom part leading up to it, but uh, we're also able to do this um, with the instructor playing a, uh, a more uh, laid back role where the, the AR is mainly guiding uh, the, uh, the trainee through. Um, we also saw that uh, the participants based on the, the usability scores were, uh, were pretty confident in the technology and that's good. Um, they feel comfortable using it uh, and they feel comfortable in the workplace. And uh, finally, uh, something that we also noted was that we didn't see any errors uh, by any of the participants through the study. And we actually had a refresher um, who is the original author of the work instruction note that uh, the AR reminded him of things he had forgotten uh, about the instruction. So next I'm going to talk about a similar application uh, we did with uh, wind turbine servicing. Um, and wind turbines are you know, similarly complex to a gas turbine, but maybe a bit more familiar. Um, so the wind turbine um, these are, you know, you see them driving on the highway, um, and the difference uh, for the group that we worked with was their wind turbines and wind farms are, uh, are out in the middle of the ocean, um, and that makes getting servicing right on the first try more critical uh, because the, the travel cost is higher, um, and, and these are in the North Sea, so you can imagine there's some bad weather. So we focused again on one key, uh, one key task, and this was uh, servicing a yaw motor, um, so you can see them here. Uh, we have one of these in the booth and the application is there, so you can come try it out. And this, uh, these motors uh, essentially rotate uh, the turbine so it faces into the wind, uh, so it generates the most power. And there's, uh, there's several of them on each turbine, so it's also, again, a common task. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a little video of the application here, um, so you'll notice a, a few key things about it. Um, so one is, uh, in addition to those, those two same uh, things we, we had in the other application, so being a panel of text and uh, uh, 3D model. You can also see here uh, gathering evidence, um, so taking photos uh, and taking uh, text memos in the application. Um, you'll see here also an animation of the uh, of the actual instruction. Uh, so this is how to take a measurement with a particular tool. So moving to the the data uh, that we gathered from this. So we looked at the the times. Um, so we noticed the times here were a little bit different. Uh, the novice had the, the lowest time, and so we, we dug into that data with the team on the ground, and we found out that the, uh, the refresher and the expert actually really got into the task, and they, they continued to do a couple of more operations. Uh, <laughs> so they were, uh, they were eager to, to keep going. But what, uh, what the, the main takeaway is here is that we see these data. Um, they're, again, in about the same ballpark, and you have your novice who's never, uh, never performed this task before uh, falling in about, about the same range uh, with the other users. Uh, looking at the uh, the usability scale, um, we again saw that the the novices um, and uh, and expert were above uh, the threshold of 68, um, and it's really important for our novice group because those are our our, our target users for this uh, primary target user. Um, we saw the the refresher falling below, um, which uh, indicates that he had to give a little bit more effort uh, to get used to the technology. So. Taking away, uh, you know, key takeaways from here, we saw the same uh, same kind of patterns that we did in the previous study. Um, the speed and efficiency were both improved uh, for the for the training. Um, the refresher, uh, who is the the most negative uh, data point of the set, um, noted that he actually felt faster completing his work uh, using AR than uh, than he did without it, and he also said that he could see himself using this on a a daily basis uh, in the future. Um, we also asked, uh, in particular, in this study about uh, you know how how the, the participants felt about the safety. Um, 
because safety is very important in the industrial applications. Uh, you know, these guys will be uh, on a, a, a really tall metal pole in the middle of the ocean um, and, uh, you know, falling off. There's lots of hard surfaces. Uh, so that's, uh, that's very important. And all of the users felt that they were safe. Um, and, and most of them, f like, commented that they felt that they would be very comfortable doing this. Uh, and then, again, we saw no errors uh, in, this, in this trial. Um, so Siemens is, is not the only you know, leader uh, who's taking steps with these uh, AR applications uh, in, in the workplace. Well, Mortensen has also built an application uh, on, on our Daiquiri uh, platform, which was used for visualizing BIM models uh, to detect clashes in a hospital construction site. Uh, Touch Surgery has created an uh, application for uh, surgical training. Um, and we're working with over uh, 150 more companies who have Daiquiri product in hand and are, are building applications today that are already changing the way that people work. So um, I'll wrap up the, the talk uh, talking about some, some best practices for you know, how you can get uh, good results with your trials um, and, and hopefully be successful and continue to expand those. So the first thing that I want to talk about is uh, you know, going to the real environments. Um, I think this is, this is you know, something that will be obvious to a number of people in the room, um, but one key to our success has been getting, uh, getting the designers and the engineers uh, who do the work uh, into the environment to check it out. Um, and when we can't do that, you know, taking measurements of key points, building mock-ups, uh, taking you know, a 3D scan, really uh, getting the context so that you can see uh, you know, the right, right way to place content and build the right application. Um, Next, uh, you know, involving the, the end users is really important. So involving those, uh, those end users uh, to get their feedback, they're often uh, there briefly at the beginning or end of a project, but really uh, checking in with them throughout the project. They know, uh, you know how they move through their space and they do their work, uh, and that has a big, uh, big influence on uh, UI and, and UX that's you know, really based on the environment that you're in. And uh, getting, that, getting that right UX, we found, has uh, big implications for how things will be adopted. And uh, you know, perhaps the most important is at the end uh, measuring the results. Like I talked about before, uh, you know, the the data uh, from this are really useful, and we we all owe a big thank you to Siemens for that. Um, some of the the big barriers uh, for for the adoption of AR are really uh, you know seeing these results uh, for companies in in you know real working environments, and being able to say, hey, I'm going to get that same uh, that same return from my investment in AR. Uh, I want to go ahead and spend more money on this and expand. Um, and once you measure those results, finally being ready to expand and, and really go to larger scale. So that concludes, uh, concludes my talk. Uh, so you can actually download uh, the, the case study uh, for the gas, um, gas turbine servicing. Um, there's a link in the bottom right of my slide there. Uh, also, come by our booth and uh, check out the applications uh, for yourself. Give them a try. We have a, a yaw motor that you can uh, practice with. And uh, I think the, re the recordings for this will be, be up in about a week. So we've had a, a number of awesome Daiquiri speakers. So come uh, you know, check those videos out. And thanks, everyone. One, one question? All right, so I think we're going to take questions. We got one question up on Slido. What feedback do you get from your customers about the comfort and wearability of the Daiquiri devices? Um, that, that's a great question. Um, so we, uh, we get feedback um, all the time. I think it's, it's really based on the environment, right? So uh, we, have, we have two wearable products. We have a Daiquiri Smart Glasses and we have a Daiquiri Smart Helmet. And uh, they're, they're really tuned to two different segments in the market. Uh, the Daiquiri Smart Helmet is tuned to more hazardous environments, right? Uh, so places where you really need a hard hat, you need protection, um, and eventually that's something we're, we're working towards having uh, be certified for hazardous locations. Um, and uh, we also have the glasses, which are uh, you know aimed at lighter industry for like uh, lean manufacturing. Um, they're a lighter device. Uh, this would be used for applications where maybe you only need a bump cap or you don't need a hard hat. Um, and th the feedback we get uh, has primarily been, uh, you know, between which of those devices is, is right for their application. Um, having released a smart helmet first, uh, we use that in a lot of environments. Um, we use that for customers that, that fit better with the glasses. And uh, mainly, um, we've seen really strong feedback and uh, appreciation for having that, you know, the right device for the right scenario from, from our customers.
Sure. Uh, so the question for everyone is, uh, how, is the, how is the team structured uh, when we go after uh, developing one of these applications? Um, and uh, so that, that team typically consists of a few people. Uh, there's there's a, a person typically who's responsible for requirements development um, discovery. So we would go out and see the client site. Um, that person acts like a, a product manager. Uh, and then once you uh, gather those requirements in execution, typically that product manager, um, and then one lead engineer, one lead designer, and uh, one lead uh, project manager who manages the execution go through. Um, and, and we try to get those people as much exposure as possible so they can lead those functions to success. I think we're at time. So thanks, everyone. <laughs>